My name is Morgan Appel, Assistant Dean for Education and Community Outreach at the Division of Extended Studies at UC San Diego, and this is Creative Conversations. On behalf of all of us here, I would like to thank you for tuning in to what is sure to be an engaging look at creating capacity, goodwill, and social capital in a unique and creative approach to regional community development in Baja, California. In this episode, we will explore the ways in which a forward-thinking not-for-profit has served as a replicable framework for transformation in southeastern Tijuana. This organization, Fundación Tu Mas Yo, or in English, the You Plus Me or the You and Me Foundation, not only offers a rallying point for educators, parents, residents, and others, including La Guardia Nacional, in building consensus around concerns in the community of Cañales del Florido, but also as a mechanism to create synergies around sustainable solutions. So without further ado, joining me today is the founders of Fundación Tumacio, Alejandro Martinez and Antonio Diaz. Team, welcome. Perhaps we could begin with getting to know Fundación Tumacio a bit better. What was the impetus for creating the organization and its efforts in this part of Baja California? Thank you, uh, Morgan, for having us uh, here. It's a it's a pleasure, and um, yeah. Well, the answer is uh, we started more than ten years ago, developing a business model uh, that was uh, really to regenerate communities that were suffering abandonment of houses and several other related problems, squatters, etc. So uh, what we decided to do for that for that business model whereby you, uh, we uh, bought uh, foreclosed low-income houses was to devote 2% of our revenue to a new foundation that, that we created, which is Fundación Tomas Joe. And um, we started investing in developing the communities that we were regenerating. Um, this is based uh, on three or four main factors. The first factor is that we uh, establish community centers. Um, so physically we have a place where people can see there is something going on. Uh, this is a private nonprofit, the, the foundation. We don't have any government support. And um, the second um, basic element is a fantastic team of uh, social uh, promoters. That's what we call them. And um, the most, most of them are women and uh, there are young uh, sociologists and uh, uh, social workers. And uh, the third element is a methodology uh, that we've been uh, uh, developing for, for these more than 10 years. And um, there, is, there, there are a lot of things to add, but I would, I would stop here just by saying that we started the foundation as part of a business model. And that's fantastic because we could have a basic a budget to count on for the developing the teams, creating the community centers, etc. Nowadays, um, that led us to a completely different uh, business model that is not related to the regeneration of communities anymore. Uh, we have a fourth success element, which is the community goodwill. Uh, after 10 years of working together with people, with families, with the kids, uh, in, in several activities that uh, Alex is going to be able to talk about, uh, we have this fourth asset, which is the community goodwill. Uh, so um, as of now, I would like to say that what we do, what we are, is a community developer based on education and collaboration. And when people realize that they are part of the solution of their community, that's where this social capital is created. And that's what we are uh, using today to further our uh, efforts in the fields of education and virtual education in the same communities that we have developed in the past. Very good. Now, now Tijuana is a large city, which is part of an even larger reason. So I'm wondering, how do you decide uh, what communities with uh, that you will work with? How do you decide uh, upon the stakeholders? Uh, you know, what 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 is the calculus of that decision? Well, in the beginning of our model, it was easy because we chose 
those communities that were most hit by their, their problems re regarding the abandonment of houses. So that was the beginning, and, and it was something that was parametrical and, and was very, uh, I could call it um, exact. So if in a community there were 6,000 homes, and out of those 6,000 homes, 1,400 were abandoned, that was a community that was of interest. Um, today, uh, these community, years after, these communities are thriving. They, they don't suffer the same problems that they were suffering in the past. But that was, that was the idea. That was to choose communities that really needed most help in terms of that aspect of their uh, life, their quality of life. Now, um, we are adding up uh, other uh, variables to choose schools, for example. So those schools have to have the, the, the size that we can uh, leverage on to impact uh, more kids. For example, the first school that we chose in one of the same first areas in Tijuana that, that you have seen has more than 1,000 uh, students. So the impact is, is much higher uh, the bigger the schools that we choose in this new phase of the development of the foundation. I don't know, Alex, if, if you want to comment on this. Well, yes, yes, uh, of, of course. As you were uh, telling at the beginning, the, the, how, the home abandonment was uh, mainly the way we were thinking about uh, some goals. But in the meantime, we find out that there was a social problem, a social issue. That, that was what I think opened our mind to, to see that we had some, to do something different on, on all this uh, uh, thing. And uh, the first one, as Antonio is telling you the story, is how do we start to work with this community? And we say, we have to build trust. We have to build trust with the, with the community. And I think that was a part of the, of the first things we started to do and went to all these axles that Antonio was, was telling you. We find out that there was a, a lot of discomfort in, the, in these communities because what they were uh, willing to have is someone that solved their problems. And then uh, we started asking for participation. So I think that was a very important issue for our model, but that, that's where we started to build our own model because we said, we need the people to participate. How can we make all these people participate? Well, we have, to, to go through their main problems to start working with them. And, and I think that's, that's more or less adds to what Antonio is telling you because we started with very, very simple projects. Maybe we, we will go and collect the trash in, a, in certain place, uh, in, in certain areas, or we will go to a small common area. And now we're building this kind of project where, where we are working with 1200 students and we are starting to build all these, uh, bringing technology, finding all these allies and starting to grow with our stakeholders every time because we are finding different groups that will be working together with us. So it's not so much, or at least not alone, building out social capital. It's also building out local capacity. It's building out local involvement. And I know that uh, the foundation is actually located in the middle of the community as well. And um, in that way is, is proximate. So you don't have somebody coming in from the outside solving problems, but as you said, really creating a consensus around uh, the, the issues to be addressed and addressing them together. Now, um, I know trust is essential. I know that building trust takes quite a while and can be lost very easily. So I, I'm wondering, how did you build out a greater sense of community in which you were a part? You mentioned starting out with some small projects and, and, and getting some wins initially. Did you run into any difficulties in the process? Yeah, well, I, 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 I'd like to tell you, Morgan, about our first experience. We Please. set up the community <laughs> center 10 years ago, and we invited uh, house by house to a, an event on a Saturday morning. And um, we invited more than 500 people and only 60 showed up. Uh, and we felt really sad because we thought it was, it was a failure you know, to just have 60 people out of 500. What we didn't know at the time is that 
those 60 people were the 60 people that really counted. Mm -hmm. Were the ones that had the energy to go to, to the community center to, uh, you know, to attend a meeting. And they remained silent for a couple of hours. So we spoke and spoke and explained and told them. And for a couple of hours, no one even raised a hand. So um, it was cold. It was mm. cold as ice uh, because these people were expecting us to ask something from them. Uh, so they were curious. They were interested in their community, but they were afraid. And uh, there was there were like four or five magic moments. But the first magic moment was when one guy raised his hand and said, so you are telling us that you're going to help us improve our community but you are not asking for any monies from us. And we said, that's correct. We will ask for your participation. We will ask for your precious time and your involvement. So um, after that, the, the situation started changing uh, and we started getting some questions. And what we didn't know is that we were finding our model to uh, find and develop change agents. So these were volunteers, they, these were people that were interested, but we had to convert them into change agents for their community. We had to convert them into a different kind of neighbor, which was interested in helping other people. And we uh, had a final magic moment in that first meeting uh, when, a, when a woman in her fifties stood up and said, well, guys, uh, why don't we just start this coming Sunday and we do a first cleaning uh, process in our main avenue? When we just start? And people started applauding, like, yeah, let's mm -hmm. do it. And let's do it this Sunday. And, and we didn't know that, you know, there were going to be like 40 people attending that cleaning uh, brigade, uh, that a good third of the community were going to be kids. Uh, um, you know, uh, these guys, the, the, the kids uh, have a completely different attitude towards fixing things. They know that th they don't know that the older people think that uh, there are no solutions. <laughs> they actually bet for a solution. So um, that was that was the very beginning. And, and I, I'm just summarizing in an example how there was one voice that, you know, of this first woman that said, let's do it, let's try it. And from then on, um, it's been 10 years of people raising a hand saying, hey, I have a project. I want to clean up the graffiti in that corner. Or, hey, I have another project. I want I want the government to fix our public uh, street lights. Uh, please help me. I don't know how to do it. I don't know who to write to. Or uh, we need better police uh, surveillance. Um, how do we talk to the police? And uh, we become kind of a uh, joint uh, uh, catalyzer for the communication of the community with authorities, with the government, with allies. Um, and we have also become a foundation that other foundations call upon to say, uh, guys, we know the situation is so difficult as a result of the COVID and we want to give away some uh, free food, but we don't know how, where to start. I mean, how do how do we do that? So they they've chosen us to to do that. Um, they are there is one huge global company. Uh, they don't like to be mentioned, but they've been giving us a, a painting um, a stuff uh, for six years now. Uh, so every year they know who to go to, you know, to give away some of the of the things that they don't need anymore. So with more than 50 allies uh, and now going into the education front, I won't get into the UCSD angle yet, <laughs> but um, um, I guess a, a, a summary answer to you is not do not wait for people to come to you. You need to invite them. And once you invite them, you need to allow them to speak up. And once you allow them to speak up, they are willing to risk their time in heading projects as, as 
varied as, as some of the examples that, can, that uh, Alex can tell us about in terms of the activities for kids or Christmas or summer. Uh, we just finished the summer camp with, uh, with kids in the area. So um, I guess it's a good moment for you, Alex, to give us some of the examples of what we've done. Yeah, well, I, I would add something because this, this question, Morgan, it's, a, it's very ex extensive. We could stay sure. like an hour talking about this because there's problems every day. But uh, there's, there's a very important issue in our communities because this happens a lot. I don't know if it's everywhere, but in this case, there are political uh, parties involved with some people in the community but, and gives them some leadership. And that is also part of the problems we find at the beginning because some of them were really, really saying, oh my God, my power is, I'm going to lose my power. So they started to threaten the community to say, don't work with too much job. Because if you work with them, you are not going to be getting the benefits you're having with me. So the people took risks, people took risks. And, and, and then we started to work as Antonio was saying, with some, some good examples. Uh, at the beginning, we were having small projects, as I told you before, uh, cleaning a park, but then we started to grow. And in the moment, the government was an ally with us and they helped us to, make, to, to uh, work in a biggest park in another place, not Cañadas del Florido, it's Hacienda Las Delicias, where we, we work in a, in a bigger area and make all these projects that uh, at, at, this, at this time, it's still alive. People is taking care of their park. No, no, no more vandalism in there. And that, that's a very important project. Also, we made um, this uh, in Cañadas del Florido, one of our most important projects at the beginning was a collection of a garbage big collection where about 40 tons of garbage were collected in all the community. And that's where we started to work with allies because the government said, I can be your ally, so I can give you, I can give you some trucks, so they will take all this garbage. But you have to take care of, of uh, taking away all the dogs that are also having uh, sick dogs and sick cats, whatever you find in the street, we have to take them away and put them in, in a special shelter. And then we will start doing all this. It was like a week of working with the community. And I think that's a very iconic moment for the Fundacion Tumasio, because people started to see, why are we doing all this? Oh, because these friends from Tumas Yo are helping us. They are helping us to do all these things we couldn't do before. And part of our, of our problems are that. I can tell you a lot about our projects. We have had about 1,400 projects since Fundacion Tumas Yo started. And it's not only Tijuana. It has been in Mexicali. It has been in, in, in Ciudad Juarez, where we are having. And we count the number of participations of the people. At this time, we have around 180,000 participations of the community members in these different cities I've been telling you. And we count the hours, about more than half a million hours of the people working with us in different projects on different things. We have, it, it, it can be a project that has to do with Zumba classes where ladies are dancing Zumba every day uh, to uh, sports events involving a whole day of activities in Ciudad Juarez, also in Mexicali. And those are the kind of projects we are working in. So, and, and those projects, people are still curious about saying, what else can we do? And that's where it's the, we, we've been taking to these places and these are the new projects we're having as part of Libo. Antonio was telling you this company that is giving us uh, things. Uh, look, now they told us last week that they can tell the name. They are Home Depot in Tijuana uh, <laughs> because they say, we are not telling everybody what we are doing. Last week, we had a hundred co-workers of Home Depot working with us in the rescue of Parque Olivos, which is another project in Cañada del Florido. And at the beginning, we didn't have their, their help and we only have like 20 or 30 people joining us. So that's, that's the way we have been growing. So what I, what I find very interesting is you mentioned working in Juarez, you mentioned working in Mexicali and, you, and your work in, in Tijuana, all of which are, are, are very different contexts, very different geographies. But it seems as though you have come upon not so much a formula, but a, a, a framework that, that really helps you find an entree into these communities um, and, and you really sort of reach a, a, a tipping point at, at which you gain trust and trust is preserved. Yes, um, I, I, would say, I would say this. Uh, people are not used to people listening to their 
real needs and then doing something about it. Uh, we, we've come to a, a model where the politicians can promise and promise and promise, not deliver, not deliver, and then we have the next one. So what we found, Morgan, I would, I would say that if there is something to say about what we found is that in a private sector nonprofit with a long-term view of why it makes sense to invest in community development uh, is needed. Is needed and it's, it's, a, it's a swivel between the, the people, the society and the government because uh, governments are short-term oriented. That's, that's, a, that's part of their essence. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can promise and not deliver. But if you have a 20 year program, a 20 year view of how to develop a community and start betting on children um, that will get information that they would not get anywhere else because their parents are working all the time because a lot of these kids don't even have a grandmother that takes care of them. So um, this, this new idea of having an investor in community development with a long-term view uh, is something that we found by chance, right? We, we, were, we were not designed in laboratory as this third party that would be the glue between the communities, the government and other allies. So um, I, I would say that's, that's, that's really the, the secret ingredient that we found. It's very obvious what I'm saying, but um, in, in a lot of communities in Mexico that you don't see at all. Uh, while I, I know that in, in, in several communities in, in, in the US, you have that. Um, and you also have some other you know, agents that are community developers. I, I mean, th th you can study in the US to do, <laughs> to do community mm -hmm. development. Uh, so that's where we are very different in terms of our culture uh, in Mexico and in the US uh, or Germany or uh, Switzerland. Uh, and that's what we found that can become a magnet for, for more people to help us or, or help us keeping doing the same. So it's really sort of a, a combination of purpose and action. And it's really the action that maybe cultivates the goodwill and cultivates trust. So it's, it's not just a matter of saying, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do this, but it's really actually doing it hand in hand with members of the community that allows you to go on to the next bigger, perhaps uh, more complex project. Now, as a private entity, um, as a private nonprofit, you, you, you talk a lot about making an investment in, in communities. And I'm wondering from your vantage point as, as founders and, and leaders of this organization, what is the return on the investment that you would hope to see? Well, um, it's been uh, so far easy to calculate because in our original model, as you um, uh, learned a few minutes ago, we used to buy houses to refurbish them and sell them. And um, well, just I'll just give you a couple of numbers. When we started, uh, we started selling homes in this place in Cañas de Florido, and I would just use that one example, mm -hmm. uh, at less than 300,000 pesos. That's $15,000 approximately. So that's a, that's a value of the houses as we sold them at the very beginning. Those same houses today are selling for $40,000. So people that invested in their own community that worked in, re in recovering public spaces and people that actually was uh, you know, betting on buying a house there, bought it for 15,000 and today is 40,000. So that's a huge return on investment for the community. So we're not measuring our return on our investment for our own uh, uh, earnings. Um, so that, that took us to a different level in terms of saying, how are we gonna be measuring the return of our investment now in the education field? And uh, that's a different kind of animal mm -hmm. because uh, the, best, the, the first conclusion that we reached to us that we will have to wait, the same thing with the houses, 10 years to see what happened. 
10 years to see the kids that were educated with our Avante seminars, where do they end up uh, uh, getting a work, getting a job? So that's a challenge. And I think it's good for us to also recognize that uh, the challenge of how to measure our, the return of our investment for this new phase is something that the only thing we know is that it's gonna cost us some money. <laughs> to measure the results is gonna cost us some money. So that's why we need, we need more allies, we need more, more uh, funds, but that's precisely what we are, what we are doing now, the, diversifying our sources of, of long-term investment money. But I, I, I can imagine that you're seeing some other sort of immediate signs of return on investment, whether it's pride in a community, whether it's seeing members of the community working together, uh, are, are, are there, and I know that you made an incredible investment in, in the local school, and I know that's something that we are going to be talking about in greater depth in, um, in an episode to come. But so you, you went from investment in real property now to making investments in education. I'm wondering how that came about. I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you, um, we're in the middle of the pandemic and um, we had to stop our community development physical activities. There was no way we were gonna be gathering people in the streets. So um, we said, well, we have to move to the virtual world and do community development with the virtual tools. And, um, and the, this was a couple of years ago. And uh, I started uh, talking to the teams. Uh, we started talking to the team saying, uh, so we're gonna move to Zoom and we're gonna do some uh, community development via computers or phones. And um, our, our social uh, workers, uh, I will never forget their face in, in, in the Zoom that we were having because they, they were having this face like, uh, Antonio, these people don't have computer. They don't have internet access and they are not going to school. So that was kind of a, you know, a hit in the face. Like here we are planning to do virtual education and virtual community development in communities that don't have the basic tools. So uh, that's why we came up with this new program called Avante, which is gonna be a subject of a further discussion. Avante in Spanish means uh, access to the new virtual uh, education tools. And um, we came up with the idea of providing three things. The first one was a computer. The second one was a internet access. And the third one was basic tools to use the computer. So do not assume that if you give a computer, someone is gonna use it for, for mm -hmm. what it's worth. So we started with 30 kids in Tijuana. Then we started with another 30 kids in Mexicali. And then with that group, we started doing adding up some other tools to the basic ones that we uh, uh, were giving at the beginning. So that's the way we came up with the, with a partnership to do STEAM uh, uh, education for the same kids. So, so they were graduating from basic tools to now understanding uh, uh, STEAM and the basic uh, aspects of it. And then we've done, we now have eight different tools uh, that are not the subject of this, of this conversation. But uh, the answer to your question is, we came up with the virtual education idea because we found a huge uh, problem. Um, the, the digital gap was going to become the digital abyss. Yes. Uh, and it's happening. So uh, so that's the way we started. Um, and then when we went again to the school to get a, a new group of, of 30, 60 kids, we realized the school was vandalized. And that's what we, we said, well, if we go 60 by 60 kids, we're not gonna have the same impact as if we focus on schools that are 1000 students each. So that's the way we embarked in this first pilot project, which value is not only to rescue one school. What we want to do is to show the world, to show Tijuana to start with, that you can join forces between families, between the principals, the authorities, and long-term uh, nonprofit money that wants to show that you can transform 
a vandalized school into an example of a virtual education center. So, um, but that's that's the way we started. That, that, that's when, you know, we applied one of our main um, maxims, which is uh, ask what they need. Mm -hmm. Do not come up with solutions coming from your brain. You know, ask what they need. And once you ask what they need and you help them organize, you commit them, you, you make them first, you know, realize that they have to commit their time and their effort and their ideas. And that's that's a whole that's a whole game. And you know what I'm very impressed by uh, of the the fundacion is that you really take a very much a holistic and strengths based approach. So it's not solely based on what is needed or what challenges are experienced, but really the strengths that lie within a community, whether it's being motivated, whether it's uh, interest in in a, in a shared experience. Now I know that you've been able to create strong bonds with with community members, strong bonds with the school. But as you mentioned, you have a lot of other partners who participate in this process. And, you know, given the initial skepticism the community may have had about motivations, I'm wondering when you bring on additional partners, whether it is perhaps a Home Depot, whether it is perhaps a local government entity or a university, how do you make those decisions? How do you make sure that that trust that you've taken so long to build isn't compromised. I guess we've developed this sense for if it's if it's going to work out long term and there is real commitment, it is going to work. Um, and uh, the only people that have approached us uh, that have not been good um, are mostly uh, people with political interests. And I'm not talking only about politicians. I'm talking mm. about, in general, people with, with political interests. And um, it has taken us time and effort to stand up and say, we're not going to fall for that. And, uh, you know, I, I, have to, I have to make a brief parenthesis here. Um, we are talking about the foundation as, a, as an abstract nonprofit entity, but we are not that. We are a team of committed people, mostly women, young women, that inspire trust. And they know how to do it. And they have the tools to do it. So um, I, I have to add this to the answer. Um, uh, it, it sounds like we are the foundation and we are the ones that are gaining trust, and we are not. In fact, is the team of very committed, extremely purposeful uh, women that are able to do this. So, um, and we learned that uh, also at the very beginning, Alex, you, you may remember when, when we were saying, you know, it's better we hire women because men are not trustworthy in general. <laughs> so um, uh, I don't want to exaggerate the point because they are also very good men and, and, and excellent people that, uh, you know, have excellent reputations, but I would I would probably simplify this by saying uh, a good uh, young woman with the right tools, the right look, you see, you see in your eyes, you see in their eyes and, and, and you, you, you know you can trust them. So that's that's probably the best, the most important aspect. And then they echo, right? Once you, once you have the trust of 10 people, then you, it's easier to get the trust from 100. And then once you have the trust of 100 people, you can you can go to the next step. Um, there are always interests that could go against the community, mm -hmm. uh, but those interests, when you, uh, I, I just resort to the, the other example, which is very physical. Um, the first time we recovered a wall that was full of graffiti, uh, the day after uh, was already with graffiti again. So what we did was to paint it again. And then after you know, five or six iterations, the graffiti people realized that we would be keeping painting the wall. So there was no purpose in them you know, keeping doing their, their thing. So that's, that's kind of this long-term, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, I'm not gonna get tired, man. I'm, I'm, you're, not gonna, you're, gonna, you're not gonna win. 
good people are more and good people are more constant, uh, but people are not. So a lot of this has to do with persistence and resilience. Alex, your thoughts? Uh, I, I would like to add something because it's, a, it's resilience, it's persistence, but it, it's, it's also a methodology. Fundacion Tomas Yo has, has been building a structure and on a parallel side, making all these projects and working with the community and being happy with, to work with them, we have a methodology. We, we, we have a, our own methodology that has to do, and there are some steps, very important steps. And one of them, the first one is a diagnose, diagnose of the community, where we find out which are the problems of the community and how, and how they prioritize it. So uh, our team, how do they say, okay, as Antonio was saying, the girls are great, motivating the people and all that, but they are working with the real needs of the community. The community says, we want to clean our community. We work on, on, on a cleaning project. If, if they say, we would like to have uh, education for our kids, a process for, for mathematics for our kids, we work on a project on a project for mathematics. Our diagnose gives us uh, important things, the problems of the community and the actives of the community, what's positive in the community. And we put those things together to solve the problems. So that's, that's I think, a very important issue that comes through all these processes because it's not only being happy working with the community and having them uh, having uh, different results. There are lots of projects that can be done, but the thing is when you work with what they want, with what they are asking you to do, that's when we start building trust. So if you tell them, we are going to bring some technological tools to, our, to your school so your kids may have the chance to study in the internet, they say, okay, you will do it. I know you will do it because that's that's part of, I, I've been with you, working with you for 10 years and I know what whatever you tell me, you we are doing it, even though sometimes it lasts more time, but uh, we do it. So th that's our methodology helps us a lot we have our indicators, we have a, a structure to work with, with the community. And then we tell the community, it's not only what we are doing for them or with them. We tell them, you have been spending all this time with us and all this time that you has a cost. And we are giving you at, at this time, it's 17 million pesos, uh, for the, the community which in dollars is about $85,000 that the community has, 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 uh, has, has put together no, it's eight hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Sorry about that. The community has been put, putting all this together to work for them. So now they know what they do has a value, mm -hmm. and that value is very important for them because now they, they they find out that they are not getting everything for free, that they are part of the formula, and they are a very important part because they are giving us time, and this time has a worth, and that, that and that value helps us a lot. That the community value goes on that, and I think that's some another very important ingredient for this trust building so there's a real consistency so it's very much a systems approach to community development community building and there's a consistency so you know you keep your promises early on but even in the 10th year you still keep your promises even if it's delivered a little bit late because it's very easy you can lose trust in in a, a incredibly easily uh, so you have this um, approach where you also do assign value, and I think that is a very important thing in, in community-focused work where they really do understand, members of the community understand, that, that there is more than sort of an altruistic value placed on what they do, that this kind of work uh, has a value in the real world. Now, I know that you have a, a, a wonderful framework, a wonderful approach. You mentioned that your team, out of curiosity, considering the incredible impacts that the Fundacion has had, whether it be in Tijuana, whether it be in Mexicali, whether it be in Juarez, how big is your team? Well, our team uh, went up in, in the most active years to a little bit more than 20 people. Um, uh, today, we're less. In total, we're uh, eight team members uh with uh, you know a, a, a very good experience of what we are doing the, the benefit of having all the experience and these eight members currently is that uh, we can multiply our effect once we need more people we we, we we now have the ability to train them in a much better way than we we were 
when we were growing, you know, uh, seven, eight years ago. So, um, and we can, we have the ability to grow with the, with the projects. And, and I have to tell you this, um, I'm, we're betting on this pilot project with the school, uh, basically all our team, because there are a bunch of things that have to be done. And, um, and I know that if we are successful with this first phase, our ability to multiply these will be, will be enormous. And, and I don't think we we're gonna be able to do this with less than four people per school yeah, in the future. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we will have the, to grow our teams again. So this multiple, so you have your staff, but you also have a team that's filled with community members. You have this wonderful, as you said, a multiplier effect or sort of a, a, a viral effect. And I'm wondering if you've seen sort of the capacity, not only for service to one's own community, but sort of a, a leadership developing organically in the communities in which you work. Yeah, exactly. And and are you are you seeing anybody from your communities emerge as leaders who will go into their communities and and, and take this um and, and take this forward? In in every community, there are always flourishes. Those are the agents of change that Antonio was was telling you, and and those are the guys that say, let's make a group of WhatsApp, and mm -hmm. I will do this. I, I I I they knock the door and they say, I have this new project. I will I I would like you to introduce me you to this situation we have. And, and in, in every community, we have different members, and some of them like sports. Others go for the arts. Others go for the education. Others go for adults, children. But all those people, all, all, all this addition of people, putting all, all these guys together, those are the, the special leaders in the community that they, they are everywhere. The only need, thing you need is to find them, to clean them, to polish them, and then they will be really bright people. I have, I have to comment on that, Morgan. Yes. That that these people, these heroes, these leaders, um, they change the look, they change clothes, they trim their hair in a better way, and their, their eyes sparkle. And the reason is that once you feel that beautiful feeling of helping other people effectively, uh, I won't say it's an addiction, <laughs> but I will say it is close to that mm -hmm. because, because you already tasted the honey of a of a you know little girl uh, you know smiling at you in the school because you you already felt how is it to deliver a computer to this other kid that didn't have one, um, and um, that that is that is contagious. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think that's a bit, that's very important to mention. Antonio, it's it's absolutely true. And the neuroscience meets it out. We call it the neurobiology, the neurochemistry of persistence. There's a wonderful sort of cocktail of, of neurochemicals that, that come out of doing something that solves a problem, doing something uh, that is success, uh, successful. I, I, I digress a bit here, but uh, this is to say that those that have the epiphany and really can take the torch forward are, I think it's a quite an amazing thing and perhaps an unintended consequence of, of the work you're doing there. So let me ask you this, uh, broadly speaking, um, for, for you, for the, the, the staff, the broader team, what is next for Fundacion Tumacio? What we can see is number one, we're changing our model from community development period to Community development based on education and collaboration. That's a new that's a new mission statement. And what is next for the foundation is to diversify our allies first. Uh, we are doing actively a, a, a diversification of allies uh, with people on a binational scale too. San Diego and Tijuana. We want to look for more help from San Diego. Uh, we have much higher incomes in San Diego. We have much more technology in San Diego. So one of the ma main things in our future is to think you uh, uh, to think of San Diego as the source of our new allies. Um, we are uh, uh, going to start 
a true alliance uh, in the true world with uh, junior achievements from San Diego. Uh, we closed a collaboration agreement and we already have the, four, the first 400 kids that are gonna have financial education in Tijuana by junior achievement in San Diego, for example. Uh, and this model uh, is gonna be a subject of other conversation, but in a nutshell, we're gonna sell the, educa the financial education to higher income uh, kids in a way that we can use the proceeds to subsidize or give or, 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 or subsidize 100% of the cost of financial education for lower income kids. Uh, that's something that is new. We've never done it. We're gonna start doing it in September. We already have two schools uh, enrolled and that's gonna be you know, the beginning of thousands and thousands of kids that will pay for their financial education that will subsidize the financial education of poor kids. Um, the repeat uh, model with the, with the Cañadas de Florido School, that's also in the horizon. And what I hope is, um, you know, alliance, uh, the alliance with, with you guys, um, that um, is, is a fantastic opportunity. It has no limits. Um, will also enable us to look for more donors. Um, I, I am firm believer in, um, you know, having a very serious project that will have very serious money behind it. And um, I, I, I know we can find it and we couldn't find it for our business model at the beginning because it was kind of a conflict of interest, right? You know, how do I give you money if you're gonna develop your business model? Now we don't have that problem. Now we are completely devoted to, you know, education, or transparency, uh, helping all the people that are not related to our business at all. And that's why I, I what's next for us is to look for more uh, sponsors, more donors that are interested in helping uh, Tijuana to start with. And um, I know we can, we, we are funding them in San Diego. Uh, our team has excellent relationships with a lot of very serious people in San Diego. And that's what is enabling us to, to do that. And, and Alex, this strikes me as an extension of the model that you're all, that you're already engaged in. It's just community building, perhaps of a different sort. Well, it's a community build, building, and I, I think it's citizen, citizenship building because our model is taking us, us to that. We are trying to treat a school as a community or the community as whatever, but the thing is to build citizenship and to recover some values that I think that they are, they are not lost, but they, are, they, they have been losing lots of things. So that's, that, that's our, one of our main goals, to build citizenship with all our procedures. You've had amazing momentum thus far, and the, the infrastructure that you've created, the framework that you created, seems to me to be very much transportable. And, um, you know, contexts in San Diego differ somewhat, although we really are very much a, a region where we... Um, share values, we share culture, we share language, we, we are uh, socioeconomically uh, intertwined. I am wondering, based on your experience, if we are looking at um, some aspiring social entrepreneurs in San Diego, or perhaps in Panama or, or, or anywhere else, is there any advice that you might offer somebody who's just starting out on this journey? Any sage words of wisdom that we can pass along? I'll start, uh, be patient. Be patient. Uh, I would say that's, if, if, if I have to give one piece of advice is be patient. Um, and I, I, I could speak hours about this, but um, I, I think we have one set of values that I mentioned already briefly. Think long-term uh, and it goes hand in hand with being patient. And um, good intentions win all the battles. So, um, and those are the pieces of the, of the equation that 
you know, are part of the system, of the systemic approach, uh, but it's not written in a textbook, right? Uh, you you have you have to uh, keep going, and uh, there is one phrase. With this, I'll, I'll finish to let Alex uh, give his his own words. Uh, but this phrase is something that also summarizes the action aspect of it, uh, and the phrase is, is one of my favorite, uh, and it says. I believe what you are saying because I'm watching what you are doing. And that's beautiful because you don't have to talk. You don't have to speak. You just have to do. And, and people will believe in you if, if your actions show that you have good intentions and, and, and you are not there to, you know, to harm anybody. So action speaking louder than words. Alex, from your vantage point, any any sage advice that you can pass along? Yes, for sure. I, I, I'd be glad. I will go especially with two words. Do it. And, and, it, and it's a, a, like, like a good start. If you are seeing problems in your community, and, and I, this is not uh, especially or private for, uh, in Tijuana, it's everywhere. If you see the problems and you are not part of the solution, then you are part of the problem. Stay away from that comfort area where you are and start feeling uncomfortable and, and, and be part of it. Don't wait for someone else to do that. You have to be part of it. Participation is important. To give your ideas is important. To tell the truth about your, the problems you have in your community, it's very important. Communicate and participate. As Antonio was saying, patience is very important because people would like to see change in one day or, or in two days. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it takes years, but the change will come. And if you start changing yourself you're in, uh, from the inside, then you will start changing whatever surrounds you. And, th and that's very important because your family surrounds you, your coworkers surround you, the community surrounds you. So I, I would go for do it, be part of the solution, stop being part of the problem. Interesting juxtaposition. So don't wait, but at the same time, be patient. And I think those are wise words indeed. Alex, Antonio, thank you. And for me, Morgan Appel, the team at Creative Conversations, and all of us at the Education Channel at UCTV, thank you for watching and thank you for helping us change the world in very creative ways. <laughs>